Well, uh, it's a holiday shortened week, but it is also a jobs week Thursday morning. We'll get the latest uh, check on the U.S. labor market in here uh, to discuss this and so much more is Michelle Gerard. She's the chief U.S. economist and a managing director over at NatWest Markets. So, Michelle, let's start with uh, what you expect to hear on Thursday about the state of the U.S. labor market. Um, and then maybe we'll get into, uh, you know, sort of what you're seeing now that, that might have you encouraged or discouraged about what the rest of the summer may look like. Well, you know, we do expect a job gain of around 7.2 million, although, you know, anybody's guess at this point, we saw last month an unexpected decline of two and a half million. That was about 10 million off of the uh, consensus forecast. So we, we all have to take uh, all of our forecasts with an especially large grain of salt in, in this environment. But I, I do expect that you're going to see more individuals being rehired reflecting the reopening in economies that we saw through late May and, and into early June. And, and so I, I think the news will be taking uh, be taken on an, an encouraging uh, bent, if you will. Uh, you know, the fact that we were able to add almost 10 million jobs over the last couple of months is, is good news. Of course, remember in, in March and April, we lost 22 million jobs. And, and in that context, there's still a long way to go to, to bring back even the majority of workers who were, were laid off as a result of COVID. And, and so then, you know, you mentioned that we lost the 20 million jobs. So, so we're back, you know, about 50% of the way, if the forecast comes through Thursday, which as you mentioned, uh, it truly is a guessing game at this point, um, <laughs> given how spotty the data has been. But, you know, if we look at what's happening now in a couple of major states, in California, Texas, Florida, Arizona, that's about 30% of GDP uh, in those states. And it's about 15% in the tri-state area. So all of a sudden we now have, a larger percentage of, of output kind of in some trouble here. What are you looking at to get a sense of how much the rise in case counts there might uh, slow down what we've seen? Um, because I think everything is regional here, but ultimately we're discussing you know national aggregated statistics, which are going to paint a picture most people I think will end up latching onto. And, and I think you make a, an excellent point, which is the fact that we we're likely to see good news like we've seen. I mean, even, for example, this morning, the pending home sales index was up a record 44 percent. You know, these these numbers for June are, are, are likely to look encouraging. We're getting that bounce. But what's worrisome, of course, is that we've seen a rise in case rates and you've even seen in, in some locations where economies have reopened, restrictions being put back on. We watch a lot of the mobility data and come up with some of our own social distancing uh, gauges, if you will. And, and we see in 43 states, you've got more restrictions now than you had, for example, at the beginning of June. Um, we're watching more than the infection rates, actually, the hospitalization rates, because ultimately that's what we think will be very uh, decisive in terms of whether or not whether or not you start to see restrictions uh, need to be put back in place. Infection rates may rise, of course, as as lockdowns are lifted. Um, it, the, the question is if, you know, if it, it tends to be toward younger individuals or healthier individuals and the hospitalization rates stay low, and we don't see the, the healthcare system become, you know, come under pressure, then, then it's okay to uh, continue to allow economies to become open. But watching now the hospitalization rates starting to rise you're seeing, you know, I think worry that even if we do get good news in June, that may stall if, if businesses are forced to, to shutter once again, even temporarily as restrictions are put back into place. And Michelle, of course, this recession is so different with this global pandemic as the lens, right? Because folks uh, perhaps who have the income, who can have that discretionary spending, they can't go anywhere. Or if they mm -hmm. choose to, uh, and they go to a different country, where are they going to be going? What are they going to be spending money on? So just thinking about how uh, the kind of upper echelon of society hasn't actually returned to pre-pandemic levels of spending while the lower class has, how do you anticipate the service sector being completely decimated? How long do you think uh, it will take for there to be sort of this recalibration and for folks to start spending again in ways that can keep uh, most of the economy employed? So you, there's a lot of important points that um, that you're making. I mean, the first thing is to, to recognize that even though we've taken a sharp uh, hit to wages and wage income as a result of the job losses, 
actually personal income is up over the last couple of months on an aggregate level because of government payments, whether it's the relief checks or very generous unemployment benefits. We're actually seeing consumers with more wherewithal to spend in aggregate. The savings rate, if you will, is up dramatically because there's been a lot of income come in that hasn't been able to be spent. Um, but the point I think you're making also is, is, is very valid, which is even if the restrictions are lifted, that doesn't mean that consumers are going to feel comfortable enough to go out and engage in many of the activities that they were doing before the outbreak, whether that's going out to eat at a restaurant or going to the gym, even getting the individual's haircut, I mean, the salons. Um, there are a lot of services that are going to see a very slow recovery out of this. And arguably, there are uh, there will be a change in consumer behavior that is far more long lasting, even after the, there's a vaccine. I think we've we've learned a lot in terms of what we are able to do without and how much we really need of certain things. And so I do expect there will be a lingering impact. Even in general, we do not have the level of consumer spending getting back to its pre-virus level until mid-2021. So in percentage terms, you'll see a bounce, but the outright level we do think is going to be you know, relatively um, you know, subdued for, for you know, almost a year. Hey investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up to the minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance and information on how to manage your money every day wherever you are.